Middle Earth is full of amazing locations, and one of my favourites from Sir Peter Jackson's film adaptation of The Hobbit is Goblin Town. The sprawling, haphazard underground city swarming with goblins and rickety structures truly sparks the imagination. I've been working on this Goblin Town board on and off for several years now, and looking back it really highlights the evolution of my terrain building techniques. For example, this piece right here originally started out life just as the rock formation and so I'd literally just taken some recycled polystyrene and hacked into it and then you've got this one over here where I basically just I use some expanding foam and then over here this one has been well it's compiled of lots of little bits of bark. With the completion of my small Goblin Town force which you can check out by clicking the link above I've decided I want a display piece for them that will also double as a corner piece for my Goblin Town board. I also received a call from John from J Max Armies of Middle Earth inviting myself and Joe from Windrush Wargamers to an evil terrain building challenge. They were yeah. just they were just making terrain together. Yeah. yeah mine's mine's just the best, so that's fine. So this is a great excuse for me to test my rock modelling and Goblin Town structure building skills. I'm Adam Haig and this is 3D Games. I have a vague picture in my head about how I want it to look and after watching the Goblin Town scenes through a few times, there are a few special features that I want to include. For the rock formation, I want there to be significant vertical height. I also want to try and recreate these sharp rocky outcrops. And then for the goblin structures themselves, I do want to include a swing bridge somewhere, as well as lots of ladders and lots of crisscrossing pathways. So with some ideas in mind, I started off by cutting a corner piece of MDF for the base, which will be braced with timber to prevent it warping and give it strength. I used a generous amount of liquid nails and some timber screws to make the frame rock solid. It always pays to countersink the screws to keep the finish nice and flush. For the rocks I wanted to utilise some of the various techniques I've learnt along the way and use a combination of pine bark and XPS foam carving. All the bottom layers were fixed in place with liquid nails to create a really strong bond. Using pieces of recycled polystyrene to build up the main body of the rocks is a really good way of keeping the weight down and reducing cost. It acts as a great foundation to which you can fix the pine bark. Starting to take shape, slowly. I kind of realise now that this is probably pretty high, actually. <laughs> oh well, I'm going to have to roll with it um, and see how we go. Local lad and fellow wargaming enthusiast Jake kindly donated to me a heap of chunky polystyrene blocks, so I figured I could use one to pack out the rock foundation. This was quite the task to cut how I wanted it because my blade just wasn't long enough to slice all the way through. This meant that I had to cut and break chunks off which made an absolute mess. Once I had more manageable shape to work with, I tidied up the surface by using my hot wire cutter to slice off sections of the polystyrene. Doing this creates a nice smooth and stronger surface for gluing materials onto. Much better than those horrible crumbly polystyrene bubbles. Using a generous amount of polyurethane glue and some toothpicks, I secured the polystyrene firmly onto the base. To create the basic shape of the sharp rocks jutting out of the main cliff face, I cut pieces of triangular shaped XPS and fixed them into place using toothpicks and polyurethane glue. I used XPS for these rather than polystyrene because it's far superior for rock carving textures. I continued building up the cliff face by gluing in place a plaster cast rock mould with liquid nails along with more chunks of pine bark. The different materials create interesting variations of texture. I didn't want any areas of polystyrene to show on the finished product because the distinctive bubbly texture ruins any sense of realism. A great use for those otherwise useless polystyrene offcuts is to pack out gaps. This reduces unnecessary waste, which is always good. Okay, now on to carving the foam. I started out by using my hot wire cutter to slice off bits here and there and start working in the basic shape of the rock formation. It also creates a reasonable starting texture to work with. I used a sharpie to roughly plan where I would cut, but didn't really take much notice of it in the end. Using a sharp kitchen knife, I sliced into the foam. Using a combination of sideways and downward slices, I cut pieces off to create the impression of layers of fragmented rock. Using different blades to slice, chop and hack into the foam creates different textures and effects. 
I used a wide variety of cuts, some long horizontal slices, some crisscross and diagonal. They all add up to help create the impression of cracks and crumbled texture of a rock face. Using a small craft knife gives you more precision, so you can really hone in on certain points where you want a bit more detail. The trick for realistic rock is to vary the concentration of texture. You shouldn't have too much everywhere. Some spaces should be left relatively flat and untouched, and others should look really crumbly with deep fissures and cracks. More texture is added by bashing the foam with a ball of tin foil. I then used a sharp piece of slate to chop into the foam some more, further enhancing the cracks and rock texture. This method of carving rocks takes time, but it's so satisfying and leads to beautiful realistic looking terrain. Again, the trick is in using a wide variety of textures and different concentrations of detail and depth. I gave the sides more structural strength and finish by fixing pieces of MDF that had been traced and cut to match the shape. The final step before painting was to blend all the different elements together with sculptor mould. This is a paper pulp and plaster combination to which you add water until it's the consistency of cottage cheese. I mushed this into all the areas in between the pieces of bark, plaster cast rock and XPS foam and shaped with sculpting tools. The great thing about sculptor mould is that it stays malleable for a long time and if it starts to harden too much, simply adding a little water allows you to carve and shape it. By following the general texture of the surrounding materials and shaping the sculptor mould accordingly, you can effectively hide all those joins and create the look of a coherent whole. Okay, so that's the rock carving and landform all complete. I've got the XBS foam combined with pine bark, the plaster cast rock mould, and then the sculptor mould to tie it all in together. So now, next step, start painting. I primed the entire model with a mixture of acrylic house paint and Mod Podge thinned with a little water. The addition of the Mod Podge ensures that everything is sealed effectively, which means that you can use spray paint without melting the foam. I applied this paint liberally and was careful to get it into all those cracks and crevices. Once the prime was completely dry, I used a rattle can to colour the rocks dark grey. Applying in a downwards angle picks up the textures and leaves the undersides and recesses looking darker. I then used a lighter grey to highlight certain areas of the rock. Now if you've ever looked at rocky cliffs in real life, you'll know that they are never just grey. So I used my airbrush to add some different browns and greens in random patches. The colours I used were Vallejo Smoky Ink, Burnt Umber, Gunship Green and Cam Green. You could do a similar thing without an airbrush by using highly watered down paint and applying it in patches with a brush. But the airbrush certainly makes it a lot quicker. Next I used some yellow ochre. This I applied with a sponge by dabbing it lightly against the rock in patches. I wanted to create a subtle look of a vein of ore running through the layers of rock and add another colour to the overall palette. I then sprayed those patches of yellow ochre with isopropyl alcohol which diffuses the paint and helps it to blend in. I then went over everything again with the airbrush and the same browns and greens to increase the saturation of the palette. Now the eagle-eyed amongst you may have noticed me talking away while making these rocks and that was me talking to my wonderful patrons. Thanks so much to all of you, it's great to hobby together over on Discord and your support helps provide resources for content like this. If you would like to support this content then please check out my Patreon link in the description. Ok now onto my favourite part of the process dry brushing. For this I used a small amount of light grey paint and lightly dragged the brush in a downwards motion. This picks up all the raised areas emphasising the textures of the rock and really brings it all to life. By dry brushing heavily on some areas and leaving other areas mostly untouched you create focal points that draw the eye. If you make everything special then nothing is special so avoid applying the same level of dry brush everywhere. I then applied some patches and streaks of watered down sapia ink to give the rocks more of a grimy stained look. Ok so I'm calling the rock formations themselves done now, uh, I'm really happy with how they've turned out, I like the subtle variations in tone uh, to the colours rather than just, just boring straight grey. Uh, when I compare it to one of my older pieces that was literally just greys and dry brushing of grey. Uh, lighter greys, whereas this one has got far more going for it. It's got much more depth, it's got much more realism to it. Now the next stage of the journey is to start my miniature timber mill. 
and start cutting some planks to start building some goblin town structures. For this, I'll need a lot of popsicle sticks. If only it was that easy. Unfortunately, in the real world, I had to mill all these pop sticks by hand. They're too wide for the scale, so I used a sharp blade to carefully split them down the middle and then weather them by shaving chips off the edges. This is a lot easier to do if you cut against the grain. Otherwise, the blade tends to slice with the grain and through your little plank rather than just taking off a small chip off the side. I then clip off the rounded ends and there it is, a single popsicle plank. For this board, I would need hundreds of these planks. So hand cramps and arthritis, here we come. You may think that carefully weathering hundreds of miniature planks is utter madness, and you're not wrong. It does, however, add a lot of extra detail and character once you start painting them, and is well worth the effort when you see the end result. Okay, so my little goblin timber mill has been hard at work producing a whole bunch of timber and posts and planks for our structures that we're going to build up onto this rock formation. The issue is that once the structures are glued in place, it will be extremely difficult to paint them without potentially ruining the look of these rocks. So I made the decision to prime all the timber components first. I used double sided tape on a paint stirrer and attached as many planks as I could fit. I did this so they wouldn't just blow all over the place when I spray them. I airbrushed them with Stinol Ray Red Brown Primer. If I had some brown spray paint, that would have been much faster. As it was, I completed these in batches and before too long I had plenty of primed timber to work with. Now to painstakingly assemble the structures. I didn't have a clear plan, but that's fine. Goblin architecture is famously chaotic. It doesn't exactly look like they follow any council building regulations. So for each platform, I start by constructing a frame. The support posts are mostly done with balsa wood square dowels. These are fixed in place with hot glue, which is great for quickly joining components. During a rather technical difficulties ridden attempt at a live stream, I cut planks to size and used hot glue to attach them to the frames. I quickly realized that I needed a better system. So the next morning I cut the planks to a couple of different standard lengths and organized them into piles. This would hopefully be much more efficient. After building a couple of frames, it was time to make the swing bridge. I glued in place two posts on either side, which will be the anchor points. I then cut two pieces of wire to size and made a loop at either end. Using wire to act as the frame will mean it is sturdy and rigid while still looking like a swing bridge. For the rope, I unraveled some, well, some rope and cut two lengths long enough to cover the wire and to wrap around the post at either end. I used hot glue along the length of the wire to fix the rope in place and then wound the ends around the posts and once again used hot glue to secure them. The excess fibres were burned off with a lighter. Just be careful not to let it burn too long. I used basin glue to attach planks to the platform. I tried to recreate the crazy chaotic goblin look by using slightly different lengths, angles and spacings. The planks for the swing bridge were fixed using hot glue to give them an extra strong bond. The annoying strings of hot glue are easily burnt away with a lighter. Okay, so I've just spent the last hour or so painstakingly tying little bits of twine around various structural points on the piece and to try and, well, just to add that level of detail and realism and it also does the added bonus of hiding those blobs of hot glue. I don't have a solid plan, I just I'm kind of just building things and adding to it as um, in, in ways that I think is going to make it look interesting. I'm just trusting in the process, I guess, at this stage and just see, see where it leads me. So I continued with the same techniques of hot gluing together frames for each platform before filling them with planks. To reinforce the rickety and dangerous look, some planks were deliberately snapped or left missing in certain places. I also added the occasional detail of a crate lid or door incorporated in with the planks. To the 6,000 practitioners of hobby crafting madness and the 70% of you who watch my videos and have not yet subscribed, truly thank you. Let's see if we can hit 7,000. If you want to have a go at making something like this yourself, please consider purchasing your hobby supplies from my affiliate links in the description. Mighty Ape and Cuppity Hobbies in my own homeland of New Zealand, Gap Games in Australia, Element Games in the UK, and Amazon in the US. This sends a little cash into the channel and is always appreciated.
With all the platforms completed, I needed to make some ladders to connect them all. To do this, I cut matchsticks to size and then glued them onto the two vertical planks. It helps to hot glue the first rung in place to avoid the posts shifting as you attach the remaining rungs. The ladders were all primed in the same way as the planks before gluing in place. Okay, so I've finished building all the structures and the ladders and now it's time to add some details. So for this I have got some 3D printed crates and barrels uh, along with some 3D printed skeletons that I've quickly painted up. And then I've got some a little bag of resin skulls, which I might just put a couple of skulls here and there. I've got this compression bandage that I'll cut the pieces out of for, for scraps of cloth. Some teddy bear fur for some like some kind of animal skins. And this hemp sack that I might be able to do something with as well. So yeah, I'm going to just add those little details here and there just to try and make it look more busy and like a lived in environment. The crates and barrels were hot glued in place at various points on the platforms. These add some nice details as well as some potential cover in game. I cut out little squares of cloth, bundled them and hot glued in place before soaking in watered down PVA. I then cut a small square of hemp sack and placed a 3D printed skeleton inside with its skull and arm reaching out. I bundled the other end and tied it with a piece of twine before gluing it onto one of the platform posts. I then cut some small bits of teddy bear fur, hot glued them in place and soaked them in watered down PVA. To give the timber a grimy and stained look, I used some sapia ink in places. When necessary, I used a piece of cardboard to avoid any overspill onto the rocks. All the timber was then dry brushed, first with raw sienna, all over the planks and posts and all areas of timber. This was then followed by a lighter dry brush with a mix of raw sienna and light grey, focusing on the edges and ends of the planks and the top of the posts. To give the crates and barrels a bit of pop and extra depth, I added some dark brown wash, then painted all the metallic sections with scrag brown to give them an old rusted look. The fur, pieces of cloth and ropes were all painted with yellow ochre followed by a dry brush of bleached bone. All the skulls and bones were painted with bleached bone followed by a wash of seraphim sapia. I carefully glued in place the remaining 3D printed skeletons to add the final touch of detail and evil goblin terrain devilry. So there we have it. This is one of the most technically complex and challenging terrain pieces I have constructed and I am thrilled with how it looks. As a display piece, populated with the evil denizens of the Misty Mountains, it has the chaotic and swarming look that I was after. I'm really happy with how the rocks look and the added details really bring the whole thing to life. Incorporating it into my Goblin Town board provides an awesome corner piece and backdrop for some epic games in the depths of the Misty Mountains. Don't forget to like and subscribe and please consider joining my Patreon linked in the description. Links to Joe and John's channels are also in the description, so make sure to check out what evil terrain they've been cooking up on their channels. Let me know in the comments if you think I've met the brief of creating some evil themed terrain and if you want to see more of my Goblin Town board completed or maybe even see a battle report. I'll see you next time on 3D Games and until then, good hobbing everyone. I really want to try and increase my efficiency so what I've... Holy sh**. Yeah, did we... I swear you're just hunting the outtakes at this point. Yeah.